Three, two, one. The second space race is on. And this time, it's not about who can put a man on the moon. It's about who will dominate the economy of the final frontier. Already, the space industry is worth more than $400 billion. By 2040, that's expected to skyrocket to $1 trillion. Private taxis into space, constellations of satellites encircling the Earth, space stations where businesses can do research or film movies. This is the new space economy, and everyone wants a piece. In this video, we'll look at the players. Once you started to see access to space to people other than NASA astronauts and, and sovereign nation astronauts, then that's going to open up, well, now that I can go to space, what can I do in space? And the many, many challenges. You have a real danger of some orbits becoming unusable, right? Like a river becomes too polluted. You cannot fish on it. And finally, the stakes. So there's resources in space, there's capabilities in space that, that we have to learn how to live and work in space in LEO, low Earth orbit, uh, and develop systems that we can then take to go deeper into space. Welcome to Business Beyond. When you think of the space economy, you may think of these guys, the space billionaires. Tesla's Elon Musk, Amazon's Jeff Bezos, and the Virgin Group's Richard Branson. For the past 20 years, they've made exploring space their passion project. Let's start with Elon Musk and his rocket company, SpaceX. Founded in 2002, SpaceX established itself as a leader in the new space economy by doing what many thought was impossible, building a reusable rocket. Musk has a lot of uh, global influence because of the successes that he has projected, right? So for example, we have been struggling with reusable rockets to low Earth orbit for a very long time. And uh, several of the scientists and engineers said this is never possible to bring down a rocket again, the first stage especially, and then to think about bringing back the second stage. Uh, it's not possible. It can be theoretically possible, but not applicable. Musk's ultimate goal is to use and reuse those SpaceX rockets to colonize Mars. But for now, SpaceX ambitions are closer to home. Like rivals, it has been giving the ultra-wealthy rides to space. Last year, it flew the first all-civilian orbital mission, led by tech billionaire Jared Isaacman, who secured his seat with a $125 million donation to the St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. On to our next billionaire, Amazon founder Jeff Bezos and his rocket firm Blue Origin, founded in 2000. Bezos sees space not as a futuristic lifeboat we can use to escape a deteriorating planet, but as a way to preserve it. We need to take all heavy industry, all polluting industry, and move it into space, and keep Earth as this beautiful gem of a planet that it is. In Bezos' view, sending private citizens into space is a way to practice. Last year, Bezos himself rode in a Blue Origin rocket to the edge of space, though only for about 10 minutes. A seat on his flight was auctioned off for $28 million. Blue Origin allows you to sign up for flights on its website, though it doesn't give the cost. And then there is Sir Richard Branson, who founded Virgin Galactic in 2004. The company had planned to start private space flights as early as 2007, but repeatedly delayed and eventually shelved those plans after a fatal rocket crash. It has, as of February 2022, reopened ticket sales for $450,000 each. The space billionaires have received a lot of criticism for spending their wealth on businesses that are giving basically joy rides to other billionaires. But others say they're laying the groundwork for an industry that will become more accessible someday. The goal is to get the price down that this is a, you know, vacation destination, right? And, and we want people to actually live and work in space. We, we want there to be a broader customer base. But space flights for the wealthy is just the tip of the iceberg for the new space economy. The space tourism sector is not the uh, major sector for contributing to the space economy of $400 billion I'm talking about. So the uh, sector that actually contributes to it, as you mentioned, is the communication sector, the telecommunication sector, and also uh, the new constellations that uh, companies like SpaceX and countries like China, India are talking about. They're talking about satellites, thousands of them orbiting the Earth transmitting TV signals, phone calls, GPS locations, military information, and of course, the weather to those of us back here on Earth. 
I don't think people realize that they actually depend on space for almost so many of their platforms today. E-commerce is supported by uh, space. Navigation is supported by space. You know, uh, transactions, for example, ATM transactions are supported by satellite support systems. So that's where the space economy is. But where exactly are those satellites? Mostly in three orbits. The closest to the Earth's surface is low Earth orbit, or LEO. Next is medium Earth orbit, or MEO. And furthest from Earth's surface is geosynchronous, or GEO orbit. LEO is the hotspot right now for satellites. The closer the satellite is to the Earth's surface, the faster it works. The trade-off is that it covers a smaller area, so you end up needing a lot more of them. Elon Musk has launched around 2,000 satellites into LEO under a project called Starlink. He eventually aims to have 42,000 in space, and he won't be alone. UK government-backed OneWeb, Amazon's Project Cooper, and the Chinese government all have plans for LEO constellations with hundreds, if not thousands, of satellites. The goal is to provide cheap satellite internet connection to even the most remote areas. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched the first artificial satellite, Sputnik. By 2030, researchers expect there to be at least 50,000 active satellites in space. You cover instantaneously a lot of people. Uh, spots, satellite spots, can range from 500, 300 kilometers in diameter to thousands and thousands. Whilst the fiber, you have to go to every single home and, and connect that home. The last mile is always a challenge. Even in developed countries like Germany, for example, you still have single digit percentage of homes that are not well connected. And, and they are not even moving. They are just not well connected because it's not economical to lay fiber to every single home. As the number of satellites being launched into space each year swells, it's starting to get a bit crowded in some orbits, not just with new satellites, but also old ones no longer in use or parts of old rockets. Collisions between all of these objects in space are adding to the problem by creating oceans of debris. Most of it is tiny, between a millimeter and a centimeter. But moving at speeds of up to 30,000 kilometers per hour, even the smallest piece of debris could cause huge damage to satellites or even space stations. In order to avoid um, um, collisions um, among satellites and the resulting debris causing further harm um, to commercial as well as institutional satellites, um, it is of utmost importance to implement what we call uh, a space traffic management. But wait, how is there no system in place regulating all of the traffic up there? Sometimes they call space the Wild West. It's not necessarily unregulated, but the regulations that are in place are patchy at best. The base for the current rules of space is the Outer Space Treaty, introduced over 50 years ago before a man had ever set foot on the moon. The Outer Space Act from the United Nations belongs to the late 60s. It was not designed to deal with this traffic, all this. The Outer Space Treaty states that the exploration and use of outer space shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interest of all countries and shall be the province of all mankind. But in practice, space is not so democratic. The United States, China, and Russia, countries with a history of well-funded space programs or large private industries, account for the majority of satellites in space. For example, uh, low Earth orbit is becoming very critical for uh, the placement of satellites, but it's actually first come, first serve. So if you have the capability to launch a satellite, and I don't, you actually get that particular orbital slot but that puts me in a disadvantage because I can get there, but I don't have the capability today. What happens if I get the capability tomorrow? Will you deny me that particular slot? According to the Outer Space Treaty, space is the common province of mankind. But you have been there first, and you have already claimed that orbital slot. The question of who can profit off of space will become even more difficult as the economy grows more advanced. There is the possibility of mining resources on the moon. So the moon has resources that are critical, titanium, helium-3, that is critical for nuclear uh, fusion, if we ever get that technology, iron ore. So in case uh, a company mines that, the Outer Space Treaty makes it clear that there has to be a way of sharing it with 
other countries because space is the common province of mankind. But consensus among all the players is proving hard to find. A little bit like climate change, just the fact that it's becoming a pressing issue is putting pressure on, on, on administrations like the American one, European community, the UK, and others to start talking to one another. It's going to be real tough to find common ground between administrations and private companies and space agencies. But it has to be tried. And, and it has to be done. In some ways, the question of space traffic, finding out what's in space and how to manage it, could end up being a test case for whether it's possible to find common ground in space. If we can solve the Leo congestion issue, I mean, what do we learn from solving that via regulation can be applicable with changes to the other orbits and, and to be a good example of how to work together, government, industry, to, to make sure that we preserve this common good. Space agencies and private companies are looking for creative solutions for space junk or ways to prevent it altogether. What we would like to do in the long term is to be able to reuse stuff that becomes space junk. Once we've deployed and the, and the system's done its primary mission, then we can actually use that as, a, as an ability to continue uh, driving. We can actually point and move it. We can uh, put payloads up on top of it. We provide power and data to them, those types of things. So in other words, it's a way to keep the, the vehicle operating normally. Other things that can be done is can be used as a base for going out, collecting debris and deorbiting debris, for example. Uh, getting space junk, if you will. But at the end of the day, some believe keeping space from becoming a littering ground is government's responsibility. If you put up a, you know, multi-billion dollar or hundred, hundreds of millions of dollar satellite, it's to everybody's interest to make sure we keep that safe. And that's where maybe governments come in and and help work to, to uh, uh, get the debris risk down that we have. But debris isn't the only problem satellites are causing. They're also making it harder for telescopes to see space. So with a lot of the satellites that are being sent up, the way that they're powered is through solar power. So they have these solar panels and even just the metal that they're made out of, depending on how it's painted, what the reflectivity is, all of that, it's catching the sun's light at certain angles. And that light then is picked up by these astronomical instruments that are observing the night sky. And if you look at the, the images that are put out by the different um, modeling um, agencies, they are showing what almost looks like a, a web or a net around the Earth caused by these satellites. And it's going to be harder and harder for these telescopes to find holes in which they can observe. Earlier, I called this the second space race. But it's important to consider the differences. The second space race is a lot focused on which country can actually invest in the commercialization of space, the economic uh, development of space, and the return of profits from that particular space investment. So it's a very different kind of space race that we're seeing today in the post-Cold War. The goal is not to be in space, it's to own it. And the players have changed too. It's not NASA versus the Soviet space program. This time it's private industry being helped on by government money. NASA is pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into companies like NanoRacks, which recently won a lucrative contract to build a private space station it's calling Star Lab. The first Star Lab that we're building will be focused around science and research. That's that's the big area that's being used right now in space, and I imagine it will be in the future. But um, you know, there'll be lots of other options and opportunities out there as well. And we can retool that and use, use the uh, Starlab for different purposes fairly easily. So why is NASA taking such a hands-off approach? We want to drive down the cost so that the NASA budget can um, move on into exploration and, and where we really believe you know, NASA's main goals are is to move further out. We've been in LEO a long time and it's time to turn this over you know, to private sector. While the US government remains by far the leader when it comes to space funding, China is also becoming a major player. If you talk about, for example, a company that's developing private rockets, they need a launch site. So what China has done is that it has offered the People's Liberation Army launch sites for a very subsidized rate. So that helps in terms of the private sector being able to meet some of the demands that come from their own government for to launch. 
The European Union, which some see as lagging behind, is also getting on board. It recently announced plans for a satellite constellation to compete with those coming from the UK, China, or US. The 27 EU member states have agreed on the need to have an autonomous European constellation guaranteeing high-speed internet access throughout the world. That's the real progress of these meetings. For the first time we're saying there are already constellations, but we don't want to depend on those. We want our own constellation. The first space race was driven by a desire for scientific prestige. This time, it's a desire for sovereignty. Having capabilities that are not dependent on, for example, uh, American companies per se. But I think it's more than that. It's just having the knowledge, the capability to innovate, creating the jobs in Europe. Space is the ultimate knowledge uh, economy, if you wish and security. I think there is a tendency to still see it from the Cold War perspective, right? But today when I listen to, for example, the speeches of President Xi Jinping or Prime Minister Modi or Japanese former Prime uh, Leader uh, Shinzo Abe, you see that they're focusing on talking about space from two perspectives. One, uh, how space is uh, critical for their internal economic development and external capability. And second, uh, in terms of national security architecture. And the desire to be at the table when the rules defining the new space economy are set. Without having a presence, it's much more difficult, you know, to be able to be a leader in those conversations. And I think those are going to be really important as we move forward, you know, into defining what does low Earth orbit look like when we have more than just a few people operating there? Outer space was never meant to be a playground for the ultra wealthy or a gold mine for the countries and the companies that were able to get there first. It's up to global leaders to introduce rules that uphold that original promise to make space a true province for all mankind. And that's it for this episode of Business Beyond. If you liked this video, you can find more like it here. Thanks for watching and see you next time.